Welcome everyone. My name is Sam Agin with Accutech and I'll be moderating today's weather. First, some information on the meeting platform. The navigation bar on the left includes a button to make the presentation full screen, a button to switch audio to phone, as well as a Q&A button to submit any questions that you may have that will be answered at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar, Don't Be Blind Sighted, Facility Sighting Insights, is the first of Accutech's five-part webinar series on process safety topics. Slide, please. Uh, slide, please. Founded in 1994, Accutech is a global leader in process safety and security, providing management and technical consulting services, world class training, as well as enterprise risk management software. Today's session will be led by Accutech facility sighting experts, Colin Armstrong and Don Connell. Colin Armstrong is a senior engineer for Accutech, focusing on areas of quantitative risk assessment and facility sighting. He's been technical lead on numerous facility sighting and QRA projects around the world. Don Connolly is a senior principal engineer for Accutech and is a technical authority for QRA, consequence modeling, facility sighting, and has served as a long-standing member of the API Facility Siting Committee. I'll hand it over to Colin now. All right, thank you very much, Sam. And uh, thank you all, everyone, for attending. Uh, we're looking forward to the presentation. So uh, jumping in here, uh, this presentation is really intended for anyone who uh, is involved in facility siting and is particularly useful for anyone who is reviewing, managing, or just interested in, in learning you know, a bit about facility siting. It's uh, kind of an introduction and a primer, as well as some, you know, a few tips and tricks maybe. Um, so first we'll talk about what is a facility siting study? Why do we perform the siting studies and what's required? Then we'll talk about the different types of facility siting studies and then some pitfalls that we often see uh, in siting studies. And generally these pitfalls relate to risks either being missed in the study or misunderstood. Uh, after that, we'll talk about how to close the gaps of the facility siting study. And then we'll open it up to Q&A. As Sam mentioned, you can submit any questions at any time during the presentation uh, through the webinar platform. He'll be collecting those throughout the presentation and we'll be answering questions at the end. I'll turn it over now, to Welcome to the webinar. Um, so what is it we're looking at when we're doing a facility siting study? What we're doing is we're evaluating process hazards and taking a look at what the impacts of those process hazards can be to, to a, a structure and to the occupants of that structure. In doing this, uh, siting studies consist of uh, a quantitative evaluation of those process hazards. And so we're talking about things like uh, explosion, overpressures, fire thermal radiation, a flammable uh, gas cloud or a, a toxic uh, gas cloud. We usually use consequence modeling for that. Uh, sometimes people have used indices such as the uh, Dow Fire and Explosion Index or the MON Index. And occasionally I've seen people use spacing tables, although that's not terribly common. Uh, we're all looking at a quantitative evaluation of the impacts of the building. So uh, how does the building respond to the hazards, whether uh, the explosion will damage that building or even collapse it versus uh, just cosmetic damage or no damage, uh, whether the fire can damage the building, whether the, that flammable gas or the toxic gas can be ingressed into the building. And then we take a look at, at uh, siting criteria, uh, be it uh, either consequence-based uh, siting criteria, such as explosion overpressure levels or a uh, toxic gas uh, level of some sort of a lethality or something like a, uh, the EPA uh, ERPGs that we have, or if it's a, a consequence-based study or a risk-based criteria, a risk criteria for using a risk-based study. So why do we perform a facility siting study? Um, essentially, it boils down to we're trying to understand what are the risks to the occupants of that building or those buildings that are under study. Uh, we're essentially answering the question, are the people in those buildings safe? 
To do this, we identify, as I mentioned, uh, the process hazards. So we're looking at sources, uh, process units, or other operations that can have a release of the hazardous material. For existing buildings, we're looking at buildings that uh, where people can be harmed. So often it's buildings that are very close to the process areas and are not built for that exposure, or uh, and which means that they're under design for that potential impact. For new buildings, we can take a look at what's the best place to put the building, or we can define for buildings that have to be close, we can define the criteria for those buildings. Um, or for uh, something like a portable building or a tent, we can look at, well, where's a good place to put that portable building or tent uh, for the temporary time that's going to be there. Another way to go about it is to come at it from the other direction and say, okay, I've got this permanent building located here. Maybe it's an office building with lots of people. So, and I want to put in uh, a modification to a process or an addition to a process or even a new process unit. Where is the best place to put that to try and reduce or minimize the impacts to the occupants of that building? And so the reasons Don just went through there of why we perform a facility siting study are what I think most people think of uh, who are familiar with siting. And that's looking at the buildings and, and their location re related to the process. But there are additional benefits that we can get from this quantitative analysis. Uh, we can use the facility siting study in addition to support our emergency response plans, whether that be to evacuate a building or shelter in place. The facility siting study plays a role in that planning. We can determine the safe time periods for shelter in place, evaluate the available time that we have to prepare to egress, uh, and then also potentially evaluate our egress routes, our are the building occupants safe when they leave the building? In the event of a, a fire, they may be protected initially inside of that building, but exposed to thermal radiation outdoors as they move towards muster points. When we look at a muster point, is it located far enough away from the hazards that the people will be safe as they assemble there? So we can, we can use it to support those emergency response plans. We can also use the quantitative data from the facility siting study to inform and improve our process hazard analyses. We have quantitative consequence results that can be used in the PHA to, to assist in being more accurate in our risk rankings. Uh, we can use it to identify risks where we need to do more focused risk analysis. The facility siting study could identify a specific process, a specific operation, or a specific vessel or piece of equipment uh, which presents a significant risk to buildings on site. And we may want to do more risk analysis, such as fault tree analysis, failure modes and effects analysis or a layer of protection analysis on that piece of equipment or that operation uh, to ensure that we've, we've mitigated those risks adequately. We can also use the facility siting study to optimize our capital and expense spending for risk reduction. Uh, because we have quantitative analysis, we can actually quantitatively assess the impacts of uh, potential changes, either relocations or retrofits of buildings, uh, detection and isolation measures, fire protection systems, or HVAC upgrades and positive pressure systems. So we can really use that data and use the methodologies to not just determine design criteria for buildings. Locations of buildings, I but help to support the site's audio. entire PSM program. Oh, we lost you at the end there. If you wanted to, to catch those couple of last bullets again. Uh, where did you lose me, Don? I, I apologize. Uh, I think it was those last uh, drive focus risk analysis, optimized capital. Ah, you lost me for, for quite a while. I, I'm sorry. Um, it, so to drive focused risk analysis, we can identify specific operations or processes that are, uh, are of significant concern uh, to building occupants or to the people on site or off site to then identify where we might want to do additional risk analysis, such as fault tree analysis, failure modes and effects analysis, or layer protection analysis. And then we can also use the facility siting study to optimize capital and expense spending for risk reduction. We can quantitatively assess the benefits of relocations, retrofits, detection and isolation systems, fire protection systems, and other uh, building upgrades.
We're moving to the next slide. There we go. Okay, what are some of our drivers for performing a facility siting study? An obvious one would be a regulatory driver. Um, and quite honestly, I haven't seen any regulations that say you must do a facility siting study. Now, one of the ones uh, that a lot of people are, are knowledge about and familiar with is the OSHA process safety management regulation. And what that regulation says that you must address facility siting under your process hazards analysis. I've seen people do this literally talking about facility siting in a HAZOP or other process hazard analysis or using a checklist. I've seen some sites that have literally uh, made a specific HAZOP or a, a what if review uh, targeted towards facility siting. And then I've seen people use a facility siting study to meet this requirement. Although I think most often I've probably seen a combination of those things. They, they use a uh, look at facility siting in their, uh, their PHAs, but they do a separate facility siting study for the uh, granularity and to get a, a more uh, refined and, and detailed look at facility siting study. The Cerveso 3 directives has a statement that says that uh, the owner or operator must demonstrate that the necessary measures have been taken to prevent a major accident and to limit their consequences for human health. There's a similar language to that in India's uh, manufacturing, storage, and import of hazardous chemicals rules. The Cerveso uh, directive also talks about having controls on new developments in the vicinity of an existing hazardous installation and on siting of uh, new hazardous installations with respect to things like residencies and businesses and the like. A number of countries use uh, land use have land use planning uh, rules that involve facility siting, uh, which would obviously be mostly targeted towards off-site facilities. Examples are the UK Coma regulation, regulations in the Netherlands, uh, Strath County, Strathcona County in Canada, and there's a number of others. And there's many process safety related rules in other countries around the. the uh, the world like uh, Australia, China, Singapore, and other uh, locations such as uh, Hong Kong. I would submit to you that while none of these directly say you have to do a facility siting study, that a facility siting study can inform uh, the activities that are required to meet those regulations, generally in combination with other activities such as performing process hazard analyses. And of course, it also better informs your decision making for your company for protecting your own workers. So uh, it's not only regulations uh, that drive facility siting studies to be completed. Uh, large operating companies often do facility siting studies around the world for their facilities, uh, regardless of regulation. And generally, uh, these are then applied through engineering practices. These may be uh, published good engineering practices, such as the API recommended practices for facility siting or internal company standards. Uh, the API recommended practices 752, 53, and 56 are applicable to permanent buildings, portable buildings, and tents, respectively. And they're applied around the world uh, and through industries beyond oil and gas they're applied in the petrochemical, specialty chemical, batch chemical uh, industries, as well as in terminals and other facilities that handle hazardous chemicals. Uh, internal company standards are often developed as well, which provide more details than the uh, generally accepted good engineering practices that we see here. The internal company standards generally will be more prescriptive about assumptions to be made, methods to be used, and the type of study to be done. Uh, generally, regardless of what engineering practice is being followed, a siting study will fall into one of two types, a consequence-based siting study or a risk-based siting study. A consequence-based study is based on maximum credible events and their impacts to buildings. We look at the maximum potential impact that could happen to a building, or the, sorry, the maximum credible impact that could happen to a building. There is a difference there. Uh, and we design the building to withstand that impact or locate it such that 
uh, it's outside of that prescribed hazard zone. A risk-based study considers the range of potential impacts that could occur as well as their likelihood. And generally, it will consider a range of hazard scenarios. Okay, so Colin mentioned a couple of the types of uh, studies. So uh, let's take a, a little bit more of a look at a consequence-based sighting study. As Colin mentioned, it's based on what some people refer to as worst credible case or worst credible scenario and referred to in the API uh, RPs uh, that he just mentioned as maximum credible events. These are the largest event that's reasonable to happen credible to happen that can impact the building. Uh, and there may be more than one maximum credible event. You may have one for vapor cloud explosion. You might have one for the fire thermal radiation and another one for a toxic release. And sometimes explosions, vapor cloud explosions can have more than uh, one maximum credible event for a building. There may be different explosions that affect the different faces or the roof of the building differently. So you need to take a look at your various maximum credible events to make sure you're, you're picking the correct set. Uh, building design gets evaluated against those impacts. So I, I mentioned explosion overpressure for blast, uh, thermal radiation for fire, a flammable uh, vapor cloud and ingress of that into the building. People usually use either the lower flammable limit or half of the lower flammable limit for that and then uh, ingress of toxic vapors. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it might be based on uh, a probe for lethality. It might be based on some sort of concentration measure, such as uh, the emergency uh, response planning guidelines, the ERPGs, or the EGLES, uh, acute emergency guidelines, something like those. Um, doing a consequence-based sighting study tends to be simpler than a risk-based study, and so it is a less costly study to perform, and that's one of the attractions of it. On the other hand, it often ends up with a higher bar to meet as far as your sighting criteria, so a higher blast overpressure or, or a, a uh, higher load of uh, thermal radiation that one has to meet to uh, to address any concerns, and thus it might actually be more costly to address the results of the study than a risk-based study, study is. Thanks, Pat. For that, Don. Um, on the left side here, you can see uh, the graphic illustrates the elements of a consequence-based sighting study. We can see at the top, we have the impact analysis to the building and the input to that come from the consequence modeling, as well as the vulnerability definitions defined for that building. Vulnerability is based on the building's design data, and our consequence modeling in a consequence-based study would be the evaluation of the maximum credible events. That could be done in a number of different ways. There are different uh, methods for doing consequence modeling, but the inputs are generally the same. We have the process data, as well as the local uh, location and climate data, the location of the releases, the uh, weather data, terrain data that feeds into the modeling. In a risk-based study, we see that the study still includes those elements from the consequence-based study, but it's expanded. And you can see here the new elements shown in purple for the risk analysis. Uh, to do the risk analysis, we have to consider not only the consequence, but the likelihood. So the largest thing that we see added here is the frequency analysis. For all of the hazard scenarios, we need to determine the, the uh, frequency or expected likelihood of the event. So we need to consider release frequencies, the climate statistics, as well as the potential for ignition and the likelihood of ignition. To the consequence modeling, we see now includes uh, additional release scenarios. When we want to evaluate and determine the full risk profile of a site, we need to consider not only the maximum credible events, we need to consider a full range of hazard scenarios from small releases, small leaks, up to uh, larger, more catastrophic events. Now, those are less likely to occur, but each of those at each end of the spectrum uh, 
contribute to the site's risk profile. So the risk-based siting is based on a full range of events. It considers the risk. Now that can be looked at in a number of different ways. We can look at the risk to specific individuals, a hypothetical worker. We can look at the risk to a specific building, or we can look at the aggregate risk. That's the total site risk. That's the risk of the process, the entire site to all people on site, or we could even include offsite populations as well. Um, buildings can then be designed to a risk-based siting criteria. So just as a structural engineer, as they go to design a skyscraper, might design for a one in 500 year wind load, uh, we may design for a one in 1,000 year blast load <clears throat> or a once in 1 million year blast load, depending on the risk criteria that's being applied. It does increase the study scope, and that does uh, mean the study will be more costly and take longer incrementally. Um, but refining that analysis can often reduce the costs to meet the siting criteria, which sometimes can be very high, especially for sites with a small footprint. So discussing a little bit further about the difference between consequence and risk, on the left side of the slide here, you'll see a blast exceedance curve. What this curve illustrates is the likelihood of an event uh, occurring at a specific overpressure level uh, exceeding a defined frequency. So in this case, we see that the maximum potential blast impact at this hypothetical building location is 5.7 PSI. That's what we would need to design for in a consequence-based study. It would identify that maximum credible impact and we would uh, design for that. We may have to have a significantly reinforced building uh, to safely house people for that level of overpressure. But if we look on the left side of the graph there, we see the likelihood of that event, the likelihood of a, of a 5.7 PSI or 0 0.4 bar uh, impact is once in 1 billion years. Now that's a pretty low likelihood. That's quite unlikely to occur. We may not want to invest to design against such a low risk. So rather than spending the additional money to design for a low uh, likelihood event, we may design for something that meets our risk criteria. In this case shown here is one times 10 to the minus six, once in 1 million years. And that is a impact of 3.6 PSI. So from a risk basis, we would design for 3.6 and we may not need as significantly reinforced of a building to design for that criteria. So looking from a risk basis, we, we see different results uh, than looking only at the potential consequences. So now we have a poll question, which uh, Sam should be sending out. And the question here is, you know, what type of siting study have you all performed? Have you performed a consequence or a risk-based siting study? This does vary around the world. It varies based on uh, preference. It varies based on regulation. Um, if you haven't performed a siting study, is that something uh, that, that you plan to do or, or something you don't think is necessary? Um, or maybe you, for other reasons, don't have a plan to. So we'll give you all a moment to respond there. I see the responses are slowly flowing in. And just as soon as it looks like that starts to slow down, I will broadcast those and you guys can take a look. But people are still responding, so I'm gonna wait just a moment. Okay. Looks like we're about there. So you all should see the results here. Uh, interesting, it looks like most people have done some combination, consequence and risk. Uh, that is quite common. We often see people start with a consequence and then look at risk, uh, a kind of a phased approach. And then we see uh, most likely after that is actually a risk-based study. And that's uh, somewhat, somewhat interesting, although risk-based and consequence-based do seem to be almost even there. So um, very interesting results. And, and then we see that 
uh, at least of the people uh, here in the webinar, most everyone has performed a sighting study already. Um, and most of those who haven't uh, do not plan to perform one for one reason or another. We should be back to the presentation here now. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some pitfalls that we see. Okay, well, we've kind of alluded to uh, one of the pitfalls earlier. Uh, that's the failure to consider all the class process hazards. Um, a lot of times people focus very heavily on blast and kind of forget about the fire thermal radiation or that toxic release or the flammable vapor cloud. And you certainly want to consider all the process hazards that can, can impact that occupied structure so that you're truly evaluating the uh, impacts, potential impacts to the people and the, the risk to the people, whether it be consequence or uh, risk-based study. Sometimes people only look at PHA scenarios. And while a P, looking at the PHA scenarios is often the start of uh, where we look for sources of releases, sometimes the PHA might not have all the releases or might not have uh, some of the types of releases. And so you need to expand your thinking beyond just the PHA scenarios. A risk-based study might take a look at only those maximum credible events. Um, doing so though, give, lo loses the possibility that you might have some of the uh, lower impact, but more likely events that actually could lend a significant contribution to the risk. And so you need to expand your thinking there as well and not, not just consider only the, the high impact, low likelihood, but also those uh, more likely, but uh, lesser impactful scenarios to truly characterize the risk involved. Yeah, that's right, Don. And you know, as we saw in the poll there too, a lot of people are doing a combination of consequence and risk. And that's something, you know, that we see you have to be very careful with when you move, especially from if you've done a consequence-based study to a risk-based study, you, know, you can't only assess the risk of those MCEs because by nature, you've defined those to be less likely scenarios. Um, another issue we see going into uh, moving often from, from consequence to risk, or as a risk-based study has started, is screening scenarios by likelihood, trying to reduce the the scope of the study by screening scenarios out saying that they're low likelihood to occur. We have to remember, especially when we look at a siting study, the risk that we're looking at is cumulative. We look at the risk to a building from all scenarios that could impact it. And if we screen out a number of scenarios because we consider them to be below some likelihood criteria, uh, we are ignoring all of that aggregate risk that together uh, they sum up to. Another pitfall uh, that, that's often run into is inappropriate application of generic hazard frequencies. So while a text may say that the blast risk in some type of process unit is once in 10,000 years or um, you know, once in 20,000, that is not applicable for all process units. The actual risk is very dependent on the configuration of the equipment, the equipment that is out there, how it is designed and how it's been safeguarded. And using that generic hazard frequencies should be done very carefully. Um, another issue can be the lack of experienced analysts or improper tools. Um, the tools that are used for facility siting studies are uh, quite complex, although they are not perfect. Uh, experienced analysts understand their limitations and know how to apply them properly um, and, and, and understand those practices. And as always, if we don't have the right information going into the study, uh, we're going to get the wrong results and garbage going into the study is just going to give us garbage results. So we need to make sure as with everything in process safety that we've got our information correct before we try to do uh, detailed analysis. All right, so now we've got our results. We need to do something about them. We need to close any gaps that are identified, assuming that there are. We need to take a look at those opportunities for improvements, to use isotype language. One thing is to be careful of is not focusing on only one solution. If you, you put your blinders on, 
you might be missing something, either that the one solution doesn't cover everything, particularly if it's a solution for blast, it might not uh, be addressing the toxic uh, ingress risk hazard or the fire thermal radiation risk hazard. But also sometimes there are maybe several lesser solutions that put together come up with a better single solution than if you were only looking at that one big solution. So, so take a look at all of your options and uh, to come up with the best solution. Sometimes the, so the best uh, answer immediately, at least, is to refine your analysis. Colin alluded to this. Perhaps uh, you're starting off with a consequence-based study and you're finding the results difficult to live with. Uh, perhaps the end thing to do then is to go ahead and do a risk-based study to further refine the analysis and, and what you need to be looking at uh, so that you can tailor your solution for the uh, the best solution for the situation. Now then, the caveat to that is that you have to be aware of analysis paralysis, where you do a study and another study and then another study and another study, and you study it to death and actually never do anything for mitigating or reducing the risk and for better protecting your people. Uh, I mentioned about evaluating all of the options. Um, it's not only from the standpoint of uh, of all the options for a particular hazard, but also all the options for all the hazards. So usually uh, there may be something to do with uh, upgrading a building for blast, to strengthen the building for blast. Uh, HVAC uh, upgrades, ventilation upgrades to can do a couple of things. One is perhaps uh, increasing the cooling load to better keep uh, people cool in the event of an external fire. Uh, particularly if that fire does not last a terribly long time, um, or the uh, ventilation upgrades may be for preventing the ingress of that flammable or toxic gas on the outside. Positive pressure is another possible mitigation measure that some people use for preventing the ingress of that flammable or toxic gas. Thermal radiation, I've seen uh, several protection measures. I've seen uh, what were of uh, these blast resistant modules particularly where people will go and uh, have put sprinkler systems either a sprinkler system or a deluge system I, I guess actually it's been more often a deluge system to keep that uh, that building cool as being the ones I can think of offhand were being used as uh, operator uh, control rooms out in the unit and they they put uh, a deluge system to keep it cool in the event of an external thermal uh, radiation from fire, external fire thermal radiation. Um, I've also seen uh, a system where uh, people have added insulation to better protect against uh, thermal radiation from fire. And recently I saw one where there was an underlayment that was reflective of the thermal radiation that people could be put behind the, uh, the sheathing on the wall or the uh, roofing overlayment and to uh, Re reflect that thermal radiation and keep the building cooler. Uh, relocation is a, uh, a common strategy, and this can take several forms. Um, perhaps you've got a building that is insufficient, and actually you're building a new building in its place or very near to it, and you're relocating people from an insufficient building to a protective building. It also might be a case of where you're moving people from an insufficient building to a building further away, whether that uh, is a building that needs to have resistance or maybe it's far enough away that it does not need to have resistance, but it's further from the hazard and distance is our friend uh, and protects the people due to that distance. Um, situation where they relocate people that are in close uh, who do not have to be there, are not supporting the operations directly um, term is often used for essential versus non-essential people. So you're getting those people that do not have to be there and relocating them further away. And then, uh, as I, I kind of mentioned this somewhat before, is relocating the building. Um, this is more a case usually with portable buildings where the portable building is put in too close to the hazards and so we can move it further away. 
Um, it doesn't, you don't have to do that work next to the process unit. You can do it further away and then carry the work in to install it like a uh, fab shop for, for uh, putting some piping together and then you move the piping in to install. It. Yeah, and so, you know- Hey, Colin? Yes, can you hear me, Don? Yes. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that, that was a good summary there, Don. And uh, those are the, the items and the, the measures that I think most people think of when we talk about, you know, responses to a facility siting study, what, what to do. But there are other solutions. Again, we want to consider everything and we don't want to just look at the buildings. We want to look at our hazards and our process as well, because there's a lot we can do there. Um, the first, we could look at fire protection active or passive fire protection that may shorten, lessen, or eliminate fire hazards. Um, this could be deluge systems, uh, changing the, the size of impoundments, providing drainage to limit pool sizes, a various uh, number of things that can be done to protect the process and, and mitigate fire hazards. We also have process safeguards. Uh, process safeguards can reduce our risk zones, right? So if we reduce the likelihood of an event occurring through safety instrumented systems, detection and isolation, uh, we can reduce the consequences and or the uh, likelihood of these hazard scenarios and reduce our risk zones. So especially in a risk-based study, we can account for these process safeguards. And then another one, and Often, I think the last one people think of, unless it's a new project, and sometimes it's not even considered then, is process relocation. And that is locating the most hazardous operations away from buildings. Generally, that's only considered, uh, again, in a greenfield site, but we shouldn't forget about it even in an operating facility. Uh, a good example of this, we did about five years ago, a facility siting study for a chemical plant uh, that unloaded a number of different chemicals on a rail spur. So they had rail cars come in, they unloaded a number of different chemicals at different unloading stations. Well, the one that was closest to the occupied buildings at this site had the greatest risk of a vapor cloud explosion occurring. And there was a significant and, and uh, to them unacceptable per their risk criteria, risk of a vapor cloud explosion from this unloading operation. And so here, there's if we looked at a building retrofit or relocation, that would be very difficult. There were a number, there were about five process buildings that could have, well, process and administration buildings that could have been impacted by this vapor cloud explosion and were at risk of impact. So rather than upgrading or relocating all of these people, um, the simplest solution here was to relocate that unloading operation for that specific chemical to the far end of the rail spur away from the occupied buildings and in one move mitigate the risk to multiple occupied buildings with with a single change so you know often relocation is forgotten um, process safeguards and fire protection are forgotten we want to remember that those are still options and often may be in combination with building changes, again, multiple solutions coming together uh, build us the best solution overall. So, we talk about many aspects of doing a facility siting study. I'd like to say a few words about a couple of uh, other ones. Um, one that we've alluded to a little bit and it comes to mind often, it's cost, but uh, another one that you might not think about all the time. Uh, but it can play a part, and that's communication. Uh, these studies involve some pretty technical details and technical concepts that uh, are difficult for many people to understand. Uh, the concept of risk is a hard one for a lot of people to get their mind around, especially if you start talking about numbers of uh, one to the uh, one in ten thousand, one in a million types of numbers. It's, it's pretty hard for the human mind to really get their get around that. Um, so communication is very important. Uh, you need to communicate managers so that they, at least on uh, uh, at some level, understand the concepts of risk 
and the information that's being presented to them, what goes into these studies, what the results are, and, and then what that tells the results tell them. But you also need to communicate to uh, the workers that can be impacted. You know, they're, they want to know what's being done to protect them. Uh, and it's good to let them know that, hey, we're doing this study, a little bit about what the study is about on a simplistic level so they have some understanding, and especially when the results come out, uh, what, uh, what you're doing to, to help improve uh, the safety of, of them in those buildings. If you don't communicate, then you run the risk of managers, on the one hand, uh, turning off and, and, uh, and not really paying attention, and the workers losing confidence that uh, we really are trying to protect uh, their safety. Um, and let's, let's you know, be real, uh, if you do nothing about it, you've gained no benefit, and nobody, uh, you know, people lose even more confidence in what's going on. So it's constant communication of what we're doing, what we're uh, coming up with, and what we're doing, especially to address the risk, is a very important one. So please don't forget that. We've kind of alluded to it. Uh, these, these studies can be very costly uh, with the results. I've seen sites spend literally tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars to address their building uh, issues at a very large, uh, like a refinery uh, site. Um, and so uh, it's not a trivial exercise to do these studies. I mean, it's important to do them so that we can quantify our risks and, and address our risks, but address when you decide to do it, you also have to be prepared to, to deal with the consequences of that, which means perhaps some, some costly uh, changes that need to be made. Um, so you want to, again, to, to uh, point that I made earlier, take a look at the various options to you so that you can come up with the best solution. And that best solution may be uh, a, a trade-off between the costs and the benefits that you get. You can make it safe enough without uh, being too costly as opposed to doing the ultimate and being very costly. But a, a cost-benefit analysis can help tell you that. Um, also looking at it may also, again, tell you do we need to sharpen that pencil and go a little bit deeper, spend a little bit more money on uh, further study, but then coming out with a better refined definition of what we need to do and thus having a, a solution that uh, is more of a, a benefit to us, both in terms of safety and cost. And so, one last item here, as with most of our risk assessments that we do in process plants, it really is a life cycle. It doesn't end with performing the study. Uh, we need to take action, uh, relocating personnel, modifying buildings or processes. Um, then there's a phase of monitoring. Uh, even once we've moved people or moved buildings, we need to monitor. We need to verify building occupancies as, as, as more people begin to occupy a building that changes the risk profile. Uh, safety systems need to be maintained to ensure that they are protecting occupants. And as trailers and tents may be brought on site uh, temporarily, their placement needs to be evaluated and considered um, throughout the operations facility. And then periodically, the study needs to be updated. If new buildings are being cited or new processes are being added or processes are being modified, the citing study um, needs to be updated to reflect that, ensure that we are still uh, protecting building occupants. And then periodic revalidation should be done, again, to ensure the study is up to date and, and up to standard. Now, I'd like to add on a little bit to that concept of monitoring, um, especially portable buildings and tents can end up in some very interesting, shall we say, places with some interesting configurations and in, in places that we do not want them or with people that should not be in them. The sites that I have seen the best uh, deal with this and, and manage it are those where people get out into the field and look and see what's going on out there. Uh, sites where I have seen people do not get out there is where the problem can get out of hand and you, you end up with these, these structures that 
are not in conformance with what your standards are or are placed in places where they do, should not be or have people that should not be in them are located. So you need to get out and monitor and make sure that uh, people are following your rules and having the people that belong there in the locations where they're allowed to be in. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Don. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to take a quick poll, asking everyone uh, what future facility, what exciting webinar topics would you like to see? And uh, while you're answering that, we're a little bit at our time commitment right now, but I'd like to just take a couple of questions uh, that were taken from the audience. The first question that I have is, what is the criteria for defining normally versus not normally occupied buildings? <laughs> oh, that's a fun one. Um, and I'm not sure that anybody's come up with a really good answer. Uh, there's been a lot of debate on it. A previous employer of mine used to define occupied as two man hours uh, per day. And that was cumulative. So it could be three people for, uh, you know, uh, whatever, 40 minutes each works out to two hours. Uh, it could be one person for two hours, you know, 10 people for uh, uh, a tenth of two hours each or something like that. Uh, and that was a criteria that uh, we had in that company. And also was one that gave us some trouble. So we were looking to see if we could find another definition. But at the point that I left them, they hadn't come up with a good answer and actually were trying to get away from that type of definition. The API uh, RPs uh, originally 753, when it first came out after a Texas City ISOM incident, had an occupancy definition in there and it was found to not be workable, and so it was taken out of that, that document. Um, so uh, the, my previous employer, what we ended up doing, um, or where, where we were at, was trying to go towards defining uh, what we meant, the types of activities we meant by intermittent uh, use of a building uh, versus what was a permanent use of a building, and some of the types of activities in the buildings that we could uh, better define and use that for determining whether a building was occupied or not occupied. All right, thanks, Don. Uh, one more question, I think, since we're a little bit over time. Uh, you mentioned a phase facility, facility siting approach. What are the benefits as compared to a consequence-only study or a full quantitative study? Uh, okay. So when we talked about a phased type of approach, that would be, a, you know, where you're doing more than one round of analysis. As Don said, you have to be careful about that. But um, a, a benefit could be that uh, you may limit the uh, scope required in the study. If you can do an initial consequence based study and you are adequately cited uh, within your citing criteria based on that, uh, you can move on. And, uh, and there's no need for more analysis. Uh, if you determine that there is an issue, you can then focus in and do a more detailed analysis uh, there on that specific process, that specific building, but you may limit the scope of the risk analysis to some extent so that you can focus in on your risk drivers or focus in on your at-risk buildings. I think there is also uh, another aspect in practical use of the results. Um, a consequence, I find that a consequence-based study is easier for people to put into practice. If you uh, take a zone type of approach like uh, API RP 753 for portable buildings for blast, if you also apply that to thermal radiation, uh, to uh, flammable gas, to toxic gas uh, releases, it's easier for people to understand this is a zone I'm not allowed in, this is a zone where I have to have some restrictions. Beyond this zone, I can have anything that I want. It's easier for people to use that than from a risk-based type of study. However, the consequence nature of the study can tend to make those zones very large, especially for something like a toxic or flammable gas release and make those unwieldy. You might have your whole site be a flammable zone or a toxic zone that would not otherwise allow you to uh, place a portable building in. And if you didn't uh, 
do something to adjust your definition a little bit. Uh, and there's also always a concern of the uh, using a risk study where people risk away the problem. They, they uh, use the, the input data that uh, they like the best, if you will. They'll give them the best results and end up risking away any problems so they can do what they wish, which is not a desirable thing either. On the other hand, the risk-based study does give you better definition. And so uh, the, it allows you probably to do a little bit more things than a consequence-based study would. So, I mean, they each have their advantages and disadvantages, but uh, that's one, one thing that I find uh, is one differential between them is consequence-based can be a little bit easier to use the results than a, a risk-based study. Great. Uh, I'm still getting a ton of questions coming in. Let me ask, answer or ask one more question. Um, when is the best time to perform a siting study for a project? Is it feed or pre-feed? Well, that's um, an, an interesting one. Uh, generally, the you know the siting study can't necessarily be done in full initially, right? But uh, it can provide a lot of benefits before detailed engineering is done. Um, when we're looking at site selection, uh, where, whether or not that site can be developed as desired or how it should be developed, there are a lot of benefits to having siting results at that point. So um, it should be, you know, should be initiated at that point before detailed engineering is done to help with site selection, layout of the site, deciding where processes should be laid out, where occupied buildings should be planned for. Um, and then as the uh, feed is completed and developed, uh, the siting study then is refined. Often that initial siting study might just be a consequence-based study, a simple coarser study looking more broadly at the risks, a conservative approach initially, and then that can be refined. It could be moved into a risk-based study or a more detailed consequence-based study that gives a more accurate picture of the risks at the site. So um, there is a lot of benefit to starting early. And often we find that, you know, we're asked to, to come in and do a siting study and it's too late. Um, you know, I've done been been asked to do a siting study for a project where the process was already set in the ground vessels were already purchased and the, the building was already, you know, half constructed at the point that they decided to do a facility siting study. The result was that that location was, was above the risk criteria uh, that was defined and they ended up building another control room located at the other end of the facility because that location was inadequate, but they had already put in foundation and, you know, a, a quite a bit of structure. And that was a hard pill for them to swallow afterwards. So, there's a lot of benefit to starting early, and um, it, it should be one of the initial things that's looked at. All right, and I'm sorry for covering myself. One more last question, uh, <laughs> which may be interesting. What standards are used to determine the requirements for buildings to be used as a shelter in place for toxic releases? There's not a lot out there. Um, something that I've looked in, to, uh, quite a bit. Uh, my last company, I had actually put together a document that kind of was a guidance for here's some of the considerations and uh, some of the constraints for uh, what you need when you decide on a shelter in place building. Uh, there's a document by the CIA, and that's not the US uh, Central Intelligence Agency, that's the Chemical Industries Association of the UK. They've got a very good document on. Uh, looking at how many people can be in a building and some of the considerations associated with uh, shelter in place. Um, beyond that, uh, it, it's a little bit sparse. There's uh, some things that talk a little bit about it, but not a, a lot that gives you a lot of really good detailed guidance. And um, unfortunately, a lot of times you need to to try and just look at uh, your, your situation and what will work for you and, uh, but also protect the people and kind of come up with your own is what I have found. Yeah, that's a very good answer there, Don. Um, the CIA 
guidance out of the UK is is probably the best that you could find in terms of a checklist to look at your building and say, am I do I have the right mitigation measures or I've considered the right mitigation measures, but it's not prescriptive. And um, this is an area that uh, certainly there is more research to be done, more development to be done um, to really quantitatively assess uh, toxic shelter in place. In the past, uh, most you know, operators often just assumed that we they would plan to shelter um, w without a whole lot of thought of how adequate their building might be. Um, there is analysis that you can do, though, to look at your building. Uh, there's testing that you can do on the building to determine its air ingress rate, the potential for toxic vapors to enter the building. And you can consider then, you know, the consequences and or the risk to those building occupants, compare that back to your siting criteria. And that's ultimately gonna answer the question of, am I protecting my building occupants? If they're not protected, again, there's mitigation measures that you can look at, but those really should be considered a bit more quantitatively and you shouldn't assume that uh, the building is safe. Coming back to another example, we did um, an incident investigation in the past where uh, a control room had significant vapor ingress and had to be evacuated in the middle of an emergency when that was not planned for. And you know that is not a situation that you want to end up in. If you're gonna plan to shelter in place, you wanna make sure you've got a good plan, understand how long you can stay in the building. And that can be done. Um, we, we've actually done that type of analysis in that example. We came back and in the new control room did exactly that type of analysis to look at that. So. Um, you, you should consider, evaluate potential for ingress and the concentration profiles in that building and, and understand the risk to those building occupants. Now, there is perhaps uh, some more help coming. Uh, Sam mentioned earlier that uh, I've been on the API uh, uh, facility siting committee for quite a while, and Colin is also on the current update, uh, ver current version of the committee where we're updating those three documents. Uh, we've got a version of 752 that's getting ready to go to ballot in the committee and starting on working on 753. Um, one of the new things that we've put into the new version of 752, and I should imagine it would also come, yeah, at least be referenced if not show up in the others, is some discussion in the appendices on uh, what is being referred to as a toxic refuge uh, to types of toxic refuges that are talked about are shelter in place and safe haven. A lot of this material comes actually from the 751 committee, the uh, the alkylation, HF alkylation folks, and they started that. And then we've uh, uh, adjusted it for the purposes of uh, the building's uh, recommended practices as well. So later, I'm not sure what the timetable is for those documents coming out. We're, we're kind of wanting to wait on publishing the uh, each of the documents separately and, and bring all three 752, 753, and 756 out together. Um, so it may be a little while, but there is some some more help coming out in the subject uh, in, in sometime in the future. I just don't know how soon. Uh, and I wanted to ask one more question again, but you have to promise to be short with it uh, with your answer. <laughs> Uh, how often are facility sightings, or when do facility sightings need to be revalidated? Is it every five years, or after a significant process change, or after every MOC? The all of the above. <laughs> as far as we talked about in the the life cycle slide, there, right? If we do make a change to the process, a change to the facility, that's going to impact the sighting study. It, it, at that point, it should be updated to reflect that, right? If we're going to put a new building in, if we're going to make a change to the process, we're installing a new storage tank. You know, if we're making a change to a valve, that's not going to affect our siting study. You know, that may be an MOC, but it's not a siting study change. So it should be checked when an MOCs are done, evaluated. Do I need to update? Is this something that's going to trigger the siting study to need to be updated? Uh, but it's not every MOC. But yes, when we make major changes to the facility or changes that impact it, those need to be considered. Um, in regards to periodic revalidation, um, you know, revalidating the site study every five years as you do for a PHA is, is a good practice and, uh, and I do believe should be done. Um, again, that's gonna depend on your local regulations, whether or not that's required. 
And following the PHA revalidation, it would be good to at least revisit the uh, the facility siting study to see if there's any scenarios that the PHA uh, revalidation has brought up that were not there before that might impact the uh, siting study as well. All right. Sure enough, Sam? Yeah, that was, that was pretty good. Um, there was another comment that should be revalidated, revalidated after a major accident. I haven't seen that. There can often be learnings that uh, should be incorporated. And we certainly looked back at facility siting studies after incidents uh, in the past. Great. Okay. Well, that is all of our time for today. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, we hope to see you at our next webinar on August 11th about the recent LG Chem release in India. If you can direct any other questions you may have or request how Accutech can further assist you to info at accutech-consulting.com. And uh, thank you for joining us and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you, everyone.